Cast. Okay, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and welcome to the Intellectual Property at the Supreme Court Series here at American University Washington College of Law. Uh, my name is Michael Carroll. I'm a faculty director here at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. Uh, we've been hosting this series or, since 2012 and delighted uh, that we were able to be joined by counsel for some of the amicus who filed a friend of the court briefs before the Supreme Court in the case we're going to talk about today, Georgia versus publicresource.org. Um, to my immediate left is Amy Chai. She serves as the Assistant Vice President in the Office of Legal Affairs at the National Association of Home Builders. They filed a brief that was in support of neither party. Um, in, their, in her capacity, Amy manages cases brought through NAHB's litigation program, and her practice encompasses a wide range of federal policy concerns, including environment, housing, finance, labor, and immigration, so copyright is not. <laughs> um, and she's uh, an alumna of this law school, so we're delighted to welcome you back. Thanks. Welcome home. <laughs> um, to her immediate left is Joseph Gratz. Joe Gratz, partner at Dewey Tengri, who's a litigator and um, uh, deals with a lot of uh, cases like this that are at the intersection of technology and, and law, particularly intellectual property law. Um, he was an advisor to the American Law Institute's project to develop a restatement of copyright and is a respected commentator on copyright and internet law, uh, named one of top nine top intellectual property lawyers under 40 by the Law 360 publication in 2015, um, and has, has uh, appeared in a number of, of influential cases involving internet search and other areas where new technology and copyright law meet. And to his left is Marta Belker, Belcher, 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 thanks, sorry, I missed that. Uh, she's an attorney in Lips and Gray's globally recognized intellectual property litigation and data practice group. Um, she represents companies, industry associations, and civil liberty organizations in matters related to blockchain and public policy. Um, she's spoken around blockchain law around the world um, and is presented twice at the World Economic Forum in Davos. That's a very select company. Um, and uh, has testified before the New York Senate and is speaking uh, both before European and U.S. legislators, again, working at the intersection of law and technology, which is at the heart of this case. Um, so we're going to get to it. This, this case... Um, involves a, a petition brought by the state of Georgia um, to have reviewed an 11th Circuit Court of Appeals opinion holding that the official code of Georgia annotated, uh, which is the official uh, version of uh, Georgia state law, does not have federal copyright. Um, and uh, now under the Copyright Act, there are certain principles that everyone agrees to in this case. So this is a bit of a strange case in that uh, it sits right in the middle of some basic propositions that are non, um, uh, that we don't have any disagreement with. Are we getting too much feedback? Okay. Um, so proposition one is that um, <clears throat> if, if the law is stated and published either in a judicial opinion, a regulatory document, or um, a, 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 legisl a state legislative text, that the author of that document is the public who is speaking through their official representatives, whether that's a legislator or a judge or the a delegated uh, administrator or, or regulator. And given that the people are the author under copyright law, that means that there is no copyright. It's in the public domain. So the text of the official text of law has no copyright because the author is the public. On the other side... Um, the copyright in derivative works can attach to any kind of original selection, arrangement, or value-added content that is appended to public domain information, including the law. So annotations and other forms of editorial uh, content that is uh, provided would generally have a copyright. What makes this a unique case is that the state of Georgia 
hires a publisher, in this case now um, Lexis, which is sort of consolidated um, some of the prior companies that perform this function, to create the annotated Georgia code. And those annotations are comprised of research tools that help identify certain aspects of the legislative history, as well as um, notes about the court cases that have interpreted the statutory sections um, and providing links to those. Um, Lexis uh, normally might produce those annotations under its own editorial direction, but in this case, the, the, those annotations are produced under the direction of the Code Revision Commission, which has a, an extensive manual that directs Lexis as to how and what, how to prepare these annotations. Um, and the other interesting piece of, of the factual basis here is that the Georgia legislature passes the law as the statutes. Then after the annotation, the entire annotated code is represented to the Georgia legislature, which reenacts it as the official Georgia code annotated. Um, and it is, it is the fact, it is that fact, it is the fact that it, the code revision commission is supervising the work. And it is the fact that the annotations are published as part of the official law of Georgia that take it out of our annotations are usually copyrightable because they're done by private authors and the public statements of public officials have no author um, and therefore have no copyright. And this sits right in the middle and the court has to figure out what to do with that. And the relevant law all comes from the 19th century. <laughs> so with that, um, I think I'm gonna pass it off and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask Joe to start us off because Joe um, has worked with uh, respondentpublicresource.org in another case. And maybe, Joe, if I can ask you to first tell us a little bit about public resource, how it got itself into this case, and then how, uh, and then what position did it take before the court in this case? Sure. And Thank you. If you can use the mic. Uh, yep. I think this one's on. Right. Um, so, uh, public.resource.org is, um, uh, at, has, has changed at various times, but is largely a, 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 the creation of one guy, and that guy is named Carl Malamud. Um, Carl Malamud is uh, a enthusiast and some would say zealot of the best kind. He's just incredibly public spirited and wants information to be available and particularly government information to be available and, and very widely available. He has a long history uh, sort of creating and working with uh, internet infrastructure and internet um, organizations uh, like the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Society back uh, going back to the 80s um, on using the internet as a resource to bring information out that might not otherwise have been able to be made accessible. And the way that's played out has led to a number of pieces of litigation um, of which this is the first to go to the Supreme Court. Um, Years ago, uh, public.resource.org created um, the Edgar system, the system for publishing SEC filings and making them easily available. And after some amount of back and forth between public.resource.org and the uh, Securities Exchange Commission, the Securities Exchange Commission ended up taking over Edgar and operates it um, to this day. And, and that's sort of one of the one of the models that that uh, uh, Carl Malamud has looked to for other projects where he wants to get it started and have the impetus to, to get things going and then hand it off to the government to do what I think he sees as the government's job, which is making information about the law and information about the workings of government easily, quickly, uh, and uh, cheaply available through the tools that the internet provides. And I think um, seeing uh, any, uh, 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 any uh, slowing of that or any forces that make that more difficult or impossible is something that he sees as sort of incompatible with the idea that we have an internet now and all of this stuff can get around uh, much more easily than it, it used to be able to. So Edgar is one example of, of things that he's done. Um, in this area in particular, he, uh, he had a project called Yes We Scan that was uh, scanning the federal reporter system or at least um, early parts of it and putting those on the internet and that, and that worked out uh, pretty well, partially because 
uh, those the parts that he ended up scanning were in the public domain, and I think that was part of uh, uh, the inspiration for the Free Law Project that uh, out of Harvard Law School that has since scanned the entire federal reporter system and put it online. Um, and then he's moved on from uh, from uh, court cases and court opinions to other sources of law, and and this is sort of part of one of a number of initiatives that he's done to make other sources of law more easily available. He scanned the official codes of a number of states, not just Georgia, and put them online and tried to raise awareness of this issue by sending uh, weird packages to uh, code revision commissions and legislators. Um, he you know, sent the Georgia uh, Code Revision Commission each uh, thumb drive containing PDFs of the entire code, it, and the thumb drive was in the form of a peach like a little plastic peach. He sent around uh, uh, potato thumb drives with the code of Idaho to people in Idaho. He, just to, to get people thinking and talking about ways that the, uh, that the law could be distributed more easily and more, um, more cheaply. And in, in, in this case, Georgia was, I think, the only state who uh, brought this forward into litigation. And, and that's what's led where we are today. This is not, however, his only current pending litigation. Um, in addition to statutory texts and official versions of statutes, um, he put online other sources of law, including standards, uh, official standards or private standards that have been incorporated by reference into the Code of Federal Regulations, where there's some place in the Code of Federal Regulations where it said, well, if you want to comply with this regulation, you need to do what it says in this standard over here, whether it's for building a government building and how you insulate it or uh, how you have to build the stairway or uh, whether it's for certain kinds of testing or whether it's for how you maintain government vehicles or whatever. Um, he's put a bunch of those standards online. And there are private standards groups who claim copyright in those standards and have filed suit against public resource in uh, the District of DC uh, in here. In that case, the district court ruled against uh, public.resource.org. It went up to the DC Circuit that more or less ruled for public.resource.org, saying that it was at least going to be a, a very close call on many of the uh, of the standards at issue, and there needed to be sort of more, a more fine-grained analysis. You couldn't do them all at once. That got remanded to the district court, and that is ongoing in the district court. So there are a number of irons in the fire and a really remarkable impact from what is effectively uh, a one-man uh, uh, organization. Okay, and then could you talk a little bit about, in this case, sort of what, um, so, so Georgia takes the position that annotations don't have the force of law, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Georgia's position in a minute. Um, uh, well, actually, why don't I do that? All right, so um, let me make it clear for the record that uh, I, um, we invited counsel for Georgia. Uh, the United States never participates in these because they never comment on pending litigation. Uh, we asked uh, counsel for all of the amicus that supported Georgia in this litigation if they'd be able to join us, and for a variety of reasons, either they didn't have client consent or scheduling didn't work out, none of them were able to join us. So we're a little bit imbalanced, and, and so I'm, I'm going to assign up to myself both the moderating role and the, uh, the role of uh, presenting the petitioner's case. So what Georgia, what Georgia says is, um, we think that there's a clear standard that emerges out of the case law. We all agree that there are basically three prior cases uh, from the Supreme Court that govern the law in this here. The earliest case is Wheaton versus Peters, in which the uh, reporter, which was an official position inside the Supreme Court, uh, who was responsible for basically describing the facts of the case and then also publishing the opinions of the Supreme Court in a volume called The Reporter, um, and he claimed that he, he Wheaton, was, that this official reporter should have copyright over the entire book, because in the 19th century we thought of copyright as being about books, and this is my book, and that was his position. Uh, and the court said, yes, for your contributions, you do get a copyright if you followed all the formalities. We're not sure you did, so we're going to send it back uh, to see if you did that. But in the last line of the opinion, just to be clear, the court says, we are all of the opinion that you do not own a copyright in our words because we speak, the public should have access to the law and we are speaking the law and that law, that has no copyright. 
court didn't explain its legal theory exactly. It didn't tie it to the statute specifically, but a more general principle that people should have access to the law and what we say is law, so therefore it should not be covered by copyright. Then in the subsequent case involving a state reporter, Banks, um, the issue was whether the state reporter, who was an official, um, could claim copyright in the state, uh, the state texts. And there again, the court said, the law is the law is the law, whether it's federal or state law. Uh, there is no copyright in the law. Um, that was then distinguished by Callahan, in which the reporter for the Illinois reports, who also created annotations as part of his job, um, claimed copyright at least in the annotations, and the Supreme Court said yes, that, that, that even though you're an official uh, of the state government, you are acting as an author under the Copyright Act, and as an author, you're entitled to claim copyright in your works of authorship, so those derivative works, those annotations, are, are covered by copyright. So Wheaton, if, if it comes up, is the early case, but it doesn't tell us much. Banks and Callahan are really the two precedents that from the later 19th century that the court will be looking at. Um, and according to George's position, there's a principle that distinguishes the two. Any text that has the force of law does not have a, a copyright with it. It falls under the so-called public edicts doctrine, which is the idea that it is authored by the people and the public edicts have no copyright. Everything else that is not uh, that does not have the force of law is subject to copyright under the normal rules under the Copyright Act. Um, in addition to those two Supreme Court cases, Georgia relies on the fact that Congress, when it was revising copyright in the, in the 1950s and 60s, leading up to the current Copyright Act, specifically looked at this issue and looked at these cases and decided that works of federal government employees would be in the public domain, all works by all federal government employees, but they were made aware that state governments did own copyright in the works of their employees under prior law and chose not to change that. So under that principle, only works by state employees that have the force of law should lose copyright. All other works, whether it's by a state employee or a state contractor, should uh, be treated as works of authorship under the normal rules. And, that, and that's essentially uh, George's position. So let me throw it back to you, Joe, to, to um, just say, what is public resources response and what's their proposed response to this force of law rule as the place to draw the line? Right. The response is, it can't just be that, that works carrying the force of law are in the public domain and everything else that state government employees do could be subject to copyright and it's just up to the state government because there are lots of works that carry the force of law that, uh, excuse me, that don't carry the force of law that are necessary to know what the law is or at least that people would reasonably look to to know what the law is. For example, we don't say that concurrences in judicial opinions can be copyrighted because, well, they don't say what the law is, that's majority opinion, or that dicta in court opinions can be copyrighted. Um, and we don't say even that legislative history or bills that are enacted, bills that are introduced but not enacted, or, um, uh, or statements made during uh, congressional or legislative, excuse me, uh, state legislative hearings can be uh, copyrighted because those are all things that you need as sort of the raw materials for making legal arguments. And there's no substitute for them. There isn't, a, you couldn't go on the market and get uh, get some better or different legislative history that, or have, or have a market incentive to create better or different legislative history. So all the things that you might reasonably look to that have uh, government are published under government authority or have have government authority upon them are things that you can't replace. And for that reason, they should be in the public domain just like the text of the law itself. Great. And so so those are the those are the positions that that, that the court was uh, uh, presented with. And I think to add to public resources, it was uh, in the oral argument it was made clear uh, it's a two step process that they want. Is this a legal text or not? So there might be something like one of the hypos in the argument is, what if the state legislature hires an official historian to tell the history of Georgia? 
and public resources position is that can be copyrighted because that is not a legal text. It is not telling you what the law is or how to interpret it. So that's step one. And then step two, is it official? Because lots of people can tell you how to interpret the law, um, but it's only when it's official that it should lose its copyright status because that gives it this added authority of the state, which is what Lexis is ga gaining by publishing the official annotated code, whereas West, West law publishes the unofficial annotated code. The content of the two might be quite similar, but the argument is that um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's officialness that causes it to lose copyright. Well, I, we can go on more, but I want to make sure our other uh, panelists get a chance to get in. So, Marga, let me ask you to go first and just tell us a little bit about who you represent, why they care, what's at stake from, uh, from their perspective in this case. Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, I was counsel for the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Cato Institute. Uh, so the Cato Institute is a libertarian organization and uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology cares deeply about uh, civil liberties as they apply to technology. Uh, and so we had sort of a both sides of the aisle brief, uh, which, which was great. Um, so we really made three points. Um, the first point we made was that granting a copyright monopoly is something that the founders did because they realized that it would ultimately lead to uh, the benefit to the public, um, that the purpose of copyright uh, is to incentivize creation. And you know, the government already has an incentive to create the official version of the law uh, because that is the government's job. And the second point we made is uh, for people to have to pay the government first to, you know, with taxes to write the law, to write these official versions of the law. Um, and then to have to pay to access is sort of a double tax. And then, of course, the access fee is also taxed, right? So sort of a triple tax there. Um, and it's really crucial that people have access to the laws that bind them and have the ability to see um, what has happened to these statutes. So for example, um, what the official code of Georgia annotated will say is, um, one example is there's a law in the books still in, in the Georgia statute um, that, that makes sodomy illegal. Now we know that that is unconstitutional, uh, but the only way you would know that from reading the statute is if you have the official code of Georgia annotated and you can see in the annotations that that uh, is in fact unconstitutional. Um, so that's really important. And then the third thing is what you've seen happen with the OCGA is Lexis is the exclusive licensee, meaning under, you know, without, uh, you know, under the way that Georgia sees it, um, there should only be one way to access the OCGA, um, and that's through Lexis, which means that there's a private party that's been deputized to be the one source of the official version of the law. Now, if you look at Lexis's terms of service, Lexis makes it very clear that they can collect your data, they can, they can collect, for example, what searches of the law you're doing, and they can hand them over to the government at any time for any reason, even without a warrant. Um, and all the time, people are convicted uh, of crimes um, based on evidence of the searches that they've done, right? You know, before they, you know, they look up what the securities laws are, and then they, um, you know, are ultimately convicted of violating securities laws. Uh, and so it's really, it, a, it has a chilling effect potentially for a private party to be able to see uh, everything that you search when you're searching the law. So those were the three main points that CDT and Cato wanted to make in this case. And, and can I just ask, what was your response? So under the, the, the state of Georgia was aware of, of how that might look, that the only way to get to the Georgia law is through Lexis. And they, so part of their contract with Lexis and, and its predecessors, because this goes back to the 1978, is that you have to make a free version available. So when you were talking about those terms and conditions, that is to the free version of, of the statute without the annotations, right? Uh, that's right. And so you, you go to, if you go to the Georgia website, um, the official Georgia website, and you click, you know, the OCGA, here's the official version of the law, it brings up uh, it brings up a pop-up that says, in order to access this version of the law, you need to agree to Lexis's terms of service. Um, and, and here they are. And you know, you click that, and of course, it's it would take you hours and hours and hours to actually read it. Uh, and uh, if you do go read it, we pulled out some of the, the choice quotes about what you are actually agreeing to. Um, but 
needless to say, uh, if you're if you're looking to violate the securities laws and <laughs> and want to search uh, there, you, you certainly have no uh, you certainly have uh, no comfort that your your data is not going to be turned over to the government uh, for any reason whatsoever. Great. Um, I'm going to come back later and, and talk about the United States position, which is a variation on, on Georgia's. Um, but, but before we do that, uh, Amy, I, I mentioned that I, I said, well, the precedents here are these two Supreme Court cases from the 19th century, and those are the immediate precedents that bear on this. But they're not the only precedents that are kind of in the water on these issues. So the other, the other one, because uh, you might ask, well, what is the National Association of Home Builders doing in a case about Georgia state law? Well, the other thing that's going on is that um, other forms of law, including things like building codes, are often developed by private parties who assert copyright in those model codes. Those model codes then sometimes get adopted by state legislatures um, and then the issue is, does the private standard setting entity continue to own a copyright or not once those, that text becomes law? Out of the Fifth Circuit, we have an opinion called VEC that says, no, that the official text uh, loses its copyright protection as enacted uh, under this sort of uh, the public edicts doctrine or alternatively under a couple of other rationales. Um, but, but maybe tell us a little bit more about, you know, obviously you're kind of watching the court to see how broadly they might rule, and you're not an IP lawyer specifically, but you do sort of understand the role of these codes in the broader industry. So maybe help us understand that. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, our brief actually is um, focuses much more on how uh, the um, this case should not focus on the building code issues uh, because they are, I, I think they are two separate issues. And so our brief, um, we kind of referred to this, our, our brief as the, this is not the droids you're looking for. Like don't, don't go into, because both parties had mentioned building codes in their, um, and standards, the ASTM case uh, in their briefing. And so that, that gave us a little bit of concern because we didn't feel that the court had all of the information in front of it. Uh, the, the process for these consensus-based is what we typically call them building codes is, uh, is a unique, at least to me, I think it's a unique process for how uh, we develop a very technical area of the law, which is uh, the, the rules and regulations you want to file, follow when you build a house. As you might imagine, we have a, a lot of standards and a lot of benefit comes from, you know, that everyone's stair treads are the same level, although I've heard people argue that there are libertarian reasons for having different ones. But nonetheless, for those of us who trip quickly, easily, like me, I like having standard stair treads and standard window openings and, and, and all of these kinds of regulations, and they're very technical, and I will not begin to understand them. Mercifully, we have a whole codes and standards department at NAHB that is very active in this process. And so uh, when we saw this case, our first concern was that we don't want the court to, based on the, the facts in this case, make any decisions on anything that would impact the status of building codes, which are created much differently than, than the annotated process. And that's that's what we, we go through a lot in our brief. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, looking at oral argument today, I think we were successful because nobody mentioned building codes. So I'm very relieved about that. Uh, but it's an issue that, that continues. There are, there's been other cases, the Fifth Circuit case. There are two cases right now. Uh, one that Joe's in, involved in, and uh, in um, New York, in New York, and yep. uh, and then the the case here in D.C. that that we're following closely, um, and and I can get in I, at some point or another in terms of our our interests um, that that we have sort of a a unique position in that we do purchase these building codes. That's how you know we have to we have to pay a fee for that. Um, and then they are adopted, you know, by jurisdiction. So then they are the, the law in that area. Um, however, because of the highly technical nature, the question that we've often asked is, who better to produce these codes? And so we have sort of a, I, I, for me, I think of it as a, as a um, and it's a question that we haven't completely answered, but it's, it's to me, it's a question of, of the, um, looking at sort of the state of the law, but then also the practical reality. And, and for me as an attorney working with my internal mm -hmm. clients, our members and our code and standards folks, um, we have a lot of conversations about how to best navigate this. You know, what, 
what should the law be, but what also is the practical reality of what's best for our members? Um, and that's, again, a, a question we're still trying to answer. Great. And we're going to circle back and talk. We're going to broaden the lens a little beyond state statutes in a, in a minute. But let me um, also, if you sort of, you know, the argument showed that um, the legal standards being offered to the justices were none of them particularly satisfactory. But at least if we're going to keep score, um, the most restrictive standard is the one George has presented in its, its brief. Only texts that have the force of law have uh, lose their copyright. And then the broadest standard would be public resources, which is, is if it's a legal text and it's official, then it loses its copyright. The United States offers a, an intermediate position, uh, recognizing some of the uh, examples that Joe mentioned, like legislative history or dicta in a, in a court opinion, as being within the scope of the public edicts doctrine, and say, well, let's not look at officialness of the, of the text itself, but rather the capacity in which the person creating the text is acting. If they are an author acting in their official capacity as a lawmaker, then it loses its copyright. So whether it's a bill that's introduced uh, in a state legislature or legislative history or, or a, a judicial dissent, those are all authored in the official capacity as a lawgiver, if you will. Um, and so under the United States version, uh, those are the kinds of things that should not have copyright. But in a case like this, where Lexis is acting as a commentator on the law and merely a compiler of, of, of these annotations, it is not speaking as the state about what the law is, and therefore the normal rules under the Copyright Act should apply, and those annotations should be copyrighted. Um, and Justice Breyer seemed to be pretty attracted to that position, but it was interesting that you know, the United States, they often call the um, the Solicitor General, the Tenth Justice, but that didn't seem to be on display as much today, uh, the amount of attention their brief got. Um, those are the main positions that Amicus offered a couple of other flavors about sort of actual authority versus apparent authority, um, and a couple of other flavors along the spectrum. Um, but wh why don't we turn to the argument itself a little bit, and I'll just go down the line starting with you, Marta, in terms of what, what you know? What did you What did you take away from the argument? Uh, sure, um, I think it was uh, definitely on display that the standards that had been presented uh, were unsatisfying for the justices, um, and I think there was a lot of grappling with exactly what types of texts we're talking about. You know, uh, uh, case summaries versus you know other types, of, right? And and trying to draw lines and figure out where the line would be drawn for particular standards. Um, and I think, I think uh, the lines were pretty, the, uh, pretty well displayed um, for some of the justices. It was pretty clear, I think, um, which side Kagan was on, which side Kavanaugh was on, which side Sotomayor was on. Um, less clear, I think, for Breyer. Um, but but uh, that was definitely surprising. Um, and I was pleased that there was at least some discussion about copyright incentives and, uh, you know, why the government uh, needs those incentives and what's going to happen, uh, you know, if this copyright incentive disappears. Um, my answer to which is nothing. But, <laughs> you know, I think they, they had uh, potentially different thoughts. Great. So what were your... Yeah, well, I mean, I think one thing, one thing that we, there is very little one can say for sure, but I think one thing we can say for sure based on the argument this morning is this is unlikely to split along the usual ideological lines. That is, it was that we, we saw a, at least for purposes of certain of the hypotheticals, a uh, gorsuch Sotomayor alliance. We had um, uh, Justice Ginsburg probably on the other side, but maybe not, we had uh, Justice Breyer taking, I think, a different uh, approach than any of the theories presented, or at least trying out a different approach than any of the theories presented, talking in what I took to be the terms of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's speech act theory. That is, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I am entirely serious that, that um, what the, he, I think he was developing a line that, I don't know, we may see in a, 
in, a, in, in some opinion or other that what matters here isn't who you are, and, it do, and what matters here isn't the capacity in which you are acting necessarily, but what matters here is whether what you are doing is a, a performative act of isn't copyrightable. And I found that, while that didn't occupy a lot of the airtime, I found that really interesting in the way that, that uh, Justice Breyer was grappling with the questions. And I, I thought the other thing that was sort of, um, I guess, disappointing for me as someone who has clients who have to grapple with, well, okay, that's all very nice, but which of this stuff can we put on the internet for free? Um, was relatively little um, sympathy for the argument that we need a bright line rule that clearly establishes you can just look at a book and say that this book is in the public domain or it isn't, and that it seems likely that there is going to be at least some fine parsing of, well, the statutory text is over here, and the catch line, that is the title on the statutory text, which Georgia claims copyright in, but not in this case, uh, is over here, and the uh, and the editor's notes are over here, and the judicial, uh, judicial opinion summaries are over here, and the notes on legislative history and the historical notes are over here, and it's going to be just pretty finely sliced, such that someone who wants to know what they can do will ha might have better principles to apply than they do now, but doesn't have, may well not have, um, clear answers in the way that I think the standards proposed by at least the t at both both the petitioner and respondent here would give you a pretty clear indication. That is, you can tell if it's legal materials and with it, whether it's published under the authority of the government or as uh, Internet Association uh, puts it in the brief that uh, I filed on their behalf, whether it's a document that or a text that's imbued with government authority that's helpful to people in understanding what their legal obligations are. Um, so I, I uh, very few predictions, but I think one prediction is I don't think we will get a uh, crisp bright line rule, and I think that's too bad for the administrability, at least, of uh, the rule that, that they come up with. Great. And then, Amy, what were your tea leaves as you read the tea leaves? Uh, yes, that's always dangerous. Um, I would agree with everything that Marta and Joe said. Um, I think I was uh, struck as well by the, the um, justices firing away hypotheticals um, at, you know, and trying to, trying to sort of figure out where the lines were and, and Gorsuch and I think it was Kagan who, which, well, what if the Code Revision Commission took this step? Well, what if the legislature took this step? And trying to figure out sort of, I think, but without giving us any real sense of, of where those lines might be, um, I think that um, I was, I, I agree that it was definitely, it's not going to be sort of the traditional 5-4 um, which is refreshing. Uh, and, and I think also, uh, again, from, from our perspective, we were very relieved that building codes didn't come into it. Um, but I think also it was interesting to hear, especially as someone who, you know, has had, you know, however, six weeks of, of copyright law, um, to hear terms like merger and the idea of, of whether or not it's the author or the capacity and, and what, what is going to govern here. And it seemed like they were kind of tossing around a lot of different ideas without anybody having any real straight lines toward anything. That's how it read to me. I was unfortunately not able to be at the court this morning, um, had a review session, it's exam season here at the school. Um, uh, but in reading the transcript, a couple of things jumped out at me and I'd, I'd love to get reactions. So one is, um, you know, the Supreme Court has precedent. They generally discuss their precedent, uh, but the precedents here are old um, and not very expressive. So Banks, Callahan, give us some idea about the application of these principles in the, in the court context, um, but really don't give us a lot to work with that was at issue. So the court seemed to take it as implicit that it's painting on a fairly blank slate here about where to draw the line, other than the text of the law is not uh, subject to copyright and, and, and and what else might not what what else might fall within that is is really up for grabs, um, and and since there are no legal standards really presented by those precedents, um, how much of a legal standard should they try to articulate in a case like this? So Joe gives us an example where they might give us a fine grained legal standard where it's very fact specific about the the legal text and whether it's 
how official it is or how official the speaker is, um, and, and we might get some gray areas, um, or they might decide to, to draw the lines a little more crisply. It's, it, it was hard to tell. The hypothetical that seemed to have the most bite was this idea that what if it wasn't Lexis making the annotations? What if it was the Georgia legislature itself that was actually enacting the, le the annotations as an initial matter? Does that change the outcome? Because under the US position, it would, because those would become legal, uh, you know, acts taken in an official capacity. Uh, whereas under the Georgia position, it would not. And, and there, none of the justices quite got an answer to that question. That, that hypo sort of fumbled its way out. The justices were interrupting each other a little bit. The rhythm, it, from the transcript, it looks like people were sort of waiting for the right moment to jump in and then two would jump in at the same time and then they were very polite oh after you no after you and then they had to figure out how that would go but um but those were my quick takeaways and and since let me just add one other in terms of normally when the court is in a position where it's fairly clear that it gets to choose a rule um then it cares about consequences like what what's the consequence of choosing this rule or that rule and consequences really didn't get a lot of airtime. The uh, Justice Kavanaugh did uh, appear to be somewhat persuaded by Georgia's representation and Matthew Bender's representation that uh, under the terms of this deal, if, if, if the court upholds the 11th Circuit, this kind of deal between a publisher and a state legislature is going to go away because Georgia gets all of this editorial service for free in exchange for granting Lexis the right to collect a copyright tax, if you will, um, as its as financial reward for providing these editorial services. Georgia's either gonna have to hire someone directly to do it or pay Lexis the cost of doing this. Um, and, and Justice Kavanaugh said, well, Georgia's not alone in this. There are a third of the states that operate under this publishing model. Do we really, is it really, important enough for us to shake this up um, and, and, and have those arrangements uh, have to be rearranged. Um, what we didn't hear is a little bit about the consequences for people like public resource, case text, uh, fast case, other kind of online publishers that are trying to enter this market and want to know the rules of the road to figure out how much public, moti public domain material they can put out there quickly and then deal with uh, things that have copyright and editorial content. So what do you, I mean, a couple of reactions on the sort of why did the precedent not play a bigger role and what about why didn't consequences play a bigger role in the argument? One quick point on why uh, precedent didn't play a bigger role. I think that the clearest, cleanest statement in any Supreme Court case about this whole area comes in Banks v. Manchester. Uh, but Here's what the statement is. Here's the sentence. The whole work done by the judges constitutes the authentic exposition and interpretation of the law, which, binding on every citizen, is free for publication to all, whether it is a declaration of unwritten law or an interpretation of a constitution or a statute. Great, right? Here's the trouble. That sentence doesn't answer any of the interesting questions here because it's not clear which parts of that sentence depend on which other parts of that sentence. And in fact, you had a situation where George's lawyer early on in his argument was reading that sentence and inserting words, which I think he vocally showed were in brackets. I don't think he was misrepresenting anything, but in order to make sense of that sentence, you need to insert some buts and some therefores and whether it's important that it's work done by judges on the one hand, which is what the United States thinks, or whether it's that it is the authentic exposition and interpretation of the law, which is binding on every citizen, which is what Georgia thinks, or whether they, whether it's important that anything that is uh, the law is free for publication to all, which is what public resource thinks. So the, I think the reason we don't have a lot from precedent here is uh, the precedent, the best precedent we have is really old and doesn't answer the interesting questions here, though I think it sets the bounds for the discussion. Um, on the question of consequences, um, I found that discussion really interesting and sort of backwards from what I expected. Um, 
And there's a question from Justice Kavanaugh, you know, does, doesn't this mean there won't be uh, annotated codes? And I think the response from uh, Public Resources Council was really, was really smart and right, which is, well, almost every state has an unofficial annotated code. So there's obviously enough market incentive for annotated codes to come about, whether there's an official one or not, because even when there's official one, there's an unofficial one. So if there ceased to be an official one, there would be the current official one either, would either become unofficial, or even if it went away, there would still be an unofficial annotated code. And then the response comes, but they cost more, right? George's is like four or six hundred dollars, four four or five hundred dollars, and the and the West version is like twenty seven hundred dollars. And and what do we take from that? And I think that the, this wasn't in any of their briefing, but but uh, Public Resources Council raised it, and I think it was it was a smart point. But that tells you that there's something in this deal that's capitalizing in some way on the officialness of the Georgia Code. That is, they're able to charge four hundred instead of twenty seven hundred dollars because they expect they're going to sell more because it says official on the cover and you shouldn't be able to capture officialness in dollars either as a private or a public actor like that's the idea of officialness is it, it's owned by everybody it's not something you can capture in dollars so I, I found that back and forth really interesting and sort of um uh sort of illuminating yeah yeah and and just to add to that on on the consequences piece um the, the, you actually uh, have to use the official code of Georgia annotated um, because you know there's there's case law that in Georgia that says the thing that you need to look at uh, and cite to is the OCGA, right? So so you're actually required to look at it regardless of of whether there are um, unofficial versions. Um, and you know I think uh, the thing that was not said uh, at all was you know what will happen if we don't have Lexus paying the government is, well, uh, the government is still probably going to have enough incentive to explain the law to its citizens uh, to, to actually continue to, to publish the OCGA. Um, and, you know, I think another thing that was not said but was said in some of the briefs is uh, there is a complete lack of competition, you know, by virtue of having an exclusive license. And, you know, Lexus's website is not known for being the best and, and easiest to navigate. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, others who could enter the market and make it easier to search, easier to, you know, pull data, um, all sorts of cool things that you, you could do uh, with the law uh, if, if you were able to copy it and republish it. Yeah, but I think the sense that I got was that the justices were not really interested in anybody's sort of the, the practical realities. It was much more on what is this rule going to be? What is the standard going to be? And um, and I think, I mean, and I thought that Justice Kavanaugh probably came the closest when he seemed to be more interested in what the states uh, would be going through. And, and I think it's an interesting, I mean, I thought that the response was very good. I actually, I, I can't answer either way. I do know that um, states have some arrangements with some of the consensus-based standards, but that it is sort of a, how did, how does, you know, I mean, states don't have a lot of money. And so would they, would they pay, you know, for this or would it be something that, you know, I mean, would it be, would it come from somewhere else? And so I, I think it's an interesting, I honestly, I don't know how it would play out, but it didn't seem to be of, of interest, nor did I think any, you know, uh, where public resource will be, I mean, the justice is never brought up like, well, what happens to public resource if we, you know, um, if, if we don't let this, this go forward. So I, I think they just, I, I think they were just uninterested. Yeah. And I think I'm gonna ask the audience to give us questions in a minute and please use the mic if you can, cause we are webcasting and folks are, are listening. But I, I, let me editorialize a little bit because I mean, as, as a copyright scholar, it's, it's interesting, you know, this is a pretty wonky case. This is a pretty wonky case, but it fits within a, a history around the role of copyright in publishing and publishing of legal information. Legal information has always been economically valuable. Law is an information business and lawyers need access to these legal materials. Um, and so it, you can make a good uh, business off of selling legal information to lawyers. And both the Westlaw and Lexis two very large you know, publishing conglomerates had their roots in, or at least one branch of that conglomerate had their roots in legal publishing. Um, and there have been these prior cases from the 19th century in, in these disputes over who actually owned the rights. And, and when we think about other things like court reporters are now in a situation where they've always made their money 
from selling physical copies of transcripts to lawyers. Um, and the internet's disrupting uh, all of all of this sort of tradition. So this this arrangement that goes back to the 70s is really an arrangement in which people still bought the law in book form, and it and that price cap on the book form was really sort of part of the deal that the Georgia law legislators thought they were making with a publisher to keep prices down. Um, and now that we can have it for free online. Um, thinking about what, what was a good deal in the 70s doesn't look like such a good deal anymore to the solo practitioner who would like to be able to have free access uh, you know, with just a hyperlink. Um, and we do see new businesses trying to enter, um, enter the market um, in, and create different forms of value add. And these new businesses would like to sort of break apart the public domain layer of the legal information from the value adds and have competition at that value add level. But then in like in Amy's context where you, you know, you you have these standard, these underlying technical standards that don't, you know, making all of that public domain would have significant financial impact. Um, and even the Copyright Act recognizes that the reference data produced by federal government employees in the National Institutes of Standards and Technology gets a copyright because those standards have all been financed through this traditional publishing arrangement and the Congress didn't want to disrupt that. So it's a narrow issue, but it sits inside a larger ecosystem of legal information that's changing an important ecosystem. And I hope folks We'll keep that context in mind. Um, and with that end of editorial comment, any comments from our folks in the audience? Or if not, do you guys want to respond to the broader picture that we're, we're, we're looking at? While folks in the audience are, I suppose, online, I don't know if we can get questions online, are thinking about that. I, I think I want, to, I, I want to restate that in, in different words and maybe stronger words. And this is just personal. This is not on behalf of the client. But, but um, where there is art, where there used to be real scarcity, right? Where there used to be, there's only so many copies of a book, and it costs money to print and ship books. That supports a certain amount of being able to build uh, build margins on top of that scarcity, right? Whether particularly for for law books and official code of Georgia annotated and and copies of standards and whatever. As we move into the electronic world, into the internet, that scarcity just goes away. I mean, it's it's not like there's only so many copies of the book. It, if something is a, a, in electronic form, there's th that piece of scarcity just goes away. And that means that cozy arrangements that were built on top of scarcity sometimes get disrupted. That doesn't mean that valuable, societally valuable things that used to get paid for by building on top of scarcity uh, don't get made or don't get paid for or don't need to get paid for, they do. But it means we may have to find a different way to pay for them than the way that we found to pay for them when everything was based on scarcity and the fact that we only could print this many copies of this book and it took up this much space on the shelf and it cost this much money to do the paper and, and, and ship it to you. And I think this case is part of a string of those where we're, we're just figuring out how to pay for and what the right economic and incentive model is for socially valuable things that used to be sort of enforceably based on scarcity. And that just that just doesn't work in a world where um, reproduction no longer has scarcity attached to it. Doesn't mean we don't have to pay for it. It's just we may have to find different ways. Yeah. Marta, Amy, any? <laughs> you don't have to. I think I would just, I would, the one thing I would add to that is that, you know, we're talking a lot about lawyers accessing this text, but, you know, the, the thing that is super, super important is, you know, particularly when you're talking about laws, is that members of the public have access, have access to the text and have access to some form of explanation of what the law is, right? Because they don't have access necessarily to, you know, shepherdize cases and, and figure out what's going on. And so uh, these certainly are, are, are very valuable. And I think that uh, there's something to be said for uh, using t taxpayer dollars to, uh, to fund that as a sort of public service. Great. Go ahead. I was wondering if this guy can elaborate on the Do 
Sure. Um, essentially, so our, again, in our, in this case, our reason for participating was because we didn't want the court to make any decisions on the, the broader, the building code issue. And so building codes, again, just to take a step back, unlike the annotated statutes, which were sort of, you know, created for Georgia, you know, by Alexis, the building code process is, is um, the consensus-based process is a two-year process. We have a code cycle, um, and it involves, you have these consensus-based bodies who then use a process which is developed by a different organization uh, in order to create these highly technical codes. And so you have government officials who participate from, you know, building code officials from the state and local level. You have uh, my association participates. We have code and standard experts. You have um, engineers and product manufacturers, and everyone basically comes to the table and they hammer out these really technical codes of what should the stair tread be, what should the insulation be, what should, you know, roof pitches and all kinds of stuff that I don't understand. And so the pro so the, the, the sort of difference with that is that all happens on it. That's a private, not-for-profit, basically, organization that does that. And so the way that they then recoup the money for, you know, their staff and their time and organizing, they, they all get together and, you know, various, I think they were in Albuquerque or Las Vegas recently, and they get together for 10 days and argue about, it's really boring. But at any rate, they argue about all of these things. Um, that all obviously costs money. And so the way that they recoup that is they then sell their codes. Uh, they sell their, their model building codes. And so, and it's all, and none of it is law until a jurisdiction decides to adopt it. And this is all done at traditionally the state and local level. Federal law, uh, there are, you know, federal, uh, federal government does adopt it for certain things, but there is not a federal building code. Um, so, so they sell it, and I think, um, and I, I put the numbers in my brief, I can't remember, but it's a couple hundred dollars usually to buy sort of the PDF version and the book version. And, and I, you know, I mean, my understanding is that they're definitely not the height of technology, but honestly, with my members, it's probably not a bad thing, um, just because we're builders. We're not, we're not big tech people. But, um, but at any rate, and so that's how, so it's a couple hundred dollars to the public to purchase that and it's not necessarily the public. I mean, most of us are not buying it, obviously. So it's a it's a different world than, for example, understanding the criminal law of Georgia, which you know I would completely I would agree is is a different world from you know understanding the annotation. So so our interest then becomes how do we what the the way right now that that body produces these standards um, is through being able to sell those codes even after they're adopted by a jurisdiction. Of course, we're also the ones who have to, to buy it. And we sometimes we agree with the code and sometimes we don't. We have a lot of big code fights. We don't always get along with the organizations that create them, but that's sort of, and I, I think something you said, that's the system that we know. That's the system that we've been in. And it's, and I think the internet is changing that. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. But I think um, should that change or as that changes, we do need to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, if, if those, bodies were all of a sudden to have their incentives removed, you know, that, you know, once your code is adopted as law, it's no longer copyright, obviously that then becomes, you know, I mean, if it's not copyright, you know, if, 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 if it's free in Georgia, it's going to be free in New Hampshire. So um, I think we need to be really mindful of how that might impact, you know, would that create a vacuum for our industry and in being, and in, in having these um, usually well thought out developed codes that are developed by a wide variety of participants. Um, would we have those available or would we have, would it be some other mechanism? Would it be the federal government that is creating these? Would it be just one sector of that organization that's creating these? And so I, I think our position right now, and it's something that our members are definitely wrestling with is let's just be thoughtful and careful about this. Like let's have, there are cases percolating. Um, we're watching those very closely. We probably will, you know, probably engage at some point. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's, we need to, if, if there is a transition to happen, we need to be very thoughtful about that. And we just, we didn't want this case to be the vehicle for any sort of broad statement that would not encompass all of those specifics. That's a great question. Yes. <laughs> Let, Please. Um, right, and right, I, uh, um, so. I'm now litigating the next case. Right. <laughs> just to, just to, um, uh, 
That's a great question, and that is precisely the question that is before the court in a case where I represent the defendant, which is International Code Council, which is this uh, private group. That, uh, one of the private one groups. Of, well, yeah, one mm -hmm. of the private groups that, that, that makes these standards against up.codes, which is a uh, startup uh, that makes building codes freely available, building codes for particular jurisdictions. And the question, what, at least one of the questions in that case is, yeah, well, I mean, what what happens to the copyright status of something when it is written by a private body and probably has copyright when it's written down? If it's just Joe's ideas on what the building code should be, I might well have copyright in that if I haven't, you know, told it to anyone or at least urged anyone to enact it as law. What changes when it gets enacted as law to its to its copyright status? And what changes either about the things, you, whether it's copyright status changes or whether the things you can do with it without, the, without infringing copyright changes, um, and whether you can, as Upcodes does, take the law of a particular jurisdiction and put it all online when most of like the building code of California is the same as the international building code published by the ICC. Um, the Fifth Circuit has said, uh, that enacted codes are not subject to copyright for one of a variety of reasons which are not made entirely clear in the Fifth Circuit's opinion. Um, and that's why they brought this case in the Second Circuit trying to create a circuit split. And so uh, depending on what the court says in this case and what the uh, district court says in the Upcodes case, which has is fully briefed on summary judgment and awaiting decision, um, uh, the decision in this case may or may not resolve that case. And if it doesn't, that may be uh, one to watch on this question uh, going forward. Obviously, I'm hopeful for my client that this does resolve that case in my client's favor, but I think that I, it will remain to be seen what the Supreme Court does uh, and how they say it in this case. Um, and I feel like everyone's kind of ignored the Fifth Circuit case. I mean, not everyone, perhaps, but in certain places, because I don't think that there's been, I mean, I think that the ICC would think that they are still holding copyright in a lot of their... The ICC is acting like the Fifth Circuit case doesn't exist. Yes. I agree with that. <laughs> um, well, on that note, that is definitely the next case. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it applies to all kinds of things. For the, for the law students in the room, it applies to the Uniform Commercial Code, which is we is been enacted in law in all 50 states, with Louisiana having its, its own flavor. Um, but it is, so it's law, but it's also treated as copyrightable in its model form. Uh, and so you can copy it in its enacted form uh, freely, but in its model form, the claim is it's still subject to copyright. Same with the restatements of contracts and torts, that when a state adopts it as law, it becomes part the text of promissory estoppel in section 90 of the restatement of contracts. We all agree that Section 90 of the restatement is not under copyright, but the rest of the restatement probably is, which is why if you try to go online right now and find the restatement of contracts, you will not get the complete text because it's not, it's subject to copyright. And just one weird sidelight on that, in as we point out in our brief, in Georgia's enactment of the UCC, at one point they, they enact the text of the UCC, which they're allowed to do, not by reference, they just plop it in their statute. But at one point, they say, well, if you need to know what the form is that you have to put this in, uh, well, we incorporate by reference the form attached to this section of the UCC, leading to the question, well, is the form attached to that section of the UCC the law? I think yes. Is it now freely copyable as part of Georgia's law? I think the answer is yes. But what would that mean for building codes? And I think I know what that would mean for building codes, but there's a disagreement. Well, on that, on that note, that at least gives us some sense of the, the salience and the stakes at issue in this case. And, and the case is now submitted, as is our discussion. Uh, and we thank the folks online who are able to join us and invite the folks in the room to a, a brief reception. Thanks very much. And thanks to our panel. Thank you.